Hello and welcome to the 55th edition of the Two Blacks and Nerdy Podcast. I'm your host, Chris. And I'm your host, Chris. And today, uh, we're going to have a fun episode for you guys. Um, we're going to be discussing the first season of The Last of Us on HBO, which just uh, concluded um, the Sunday after this recording. We're recording on a Wednesday. Um, so we're really excited to talk about it. Um, we have a couple wonderful guests uh, from the world of TikTok on. So, Chris, you can go ahead and uh, do the introductions and we can get started. Yeah, bring some friends along the way to talk, have a fun discussion about emotionally devastating content. Uh, so first, we're going to bring on Danielle, who is on TikTok and Twitter and Tumblr and a whole bunch of other things, but has also <laughs> been writing articles about The Last of Us on Temple of Geek. So Danielle, uh, introduce yourself and tell the people where they can find you. Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. I'm Danielle on TikTok. I'm at Written in the Star Wars. And on Twitter, I'm at DannyS394. And I'm just really excited. Yeah, I have some articles on Temple of Geek about The Last of Us. So check those out if you want to. All right. And next we have Brooke, uh, who uh, is a, well, I think this is the third or fourth time on on the podcast who has been hosting Twitter spaces uh, about The Last of Us after every episode, as well as streaming it on Twitch. Yeah. So welcome back, Brooke. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm back. Yeah. So who's uh, ready to be talk about sad things? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to wonder how we should go about this. So all right, I guess we'll go around uh and just give like general thoughts about the show. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Etc. And then I think I don't know if we need to go episode by episode. I feel like we can sort of just talk about the aspects that we thought we think are interesting. And you know, Probably going to have some debates, I'm sure, especially with the ending. Maybe, maybe not. So um, uh, does anybody want to go? Anybody want to go first? Just give thoughts about the show. You all hated it, right? It was the worst oh. video game yeah. <laughs> ever um, All exist. I'm saying is that no, no one threw a bottle or a brick. I know. So it was <laughs> mid. There was no, there was no uh, panels that Ellie had to sit on while Joel moved her across the water. Yeah. <laughs> so what was up with that? <laughs> But we got the puns, though, right? We did get the we puns. Did. We did get the puns. Uh, I really enjoyed this season. Uh, I love The Last of Us as a story, and I have for a little while now. So I don't. I don't want to say that my expectations were high because I knew I would love it regardless of how bad it would could potentially be, especially because Pedro Pascal was in it. But I it, it exceeded my expectations, and as usual. Pedro Pascal was just an amazing, phenomenal actor. And so was Bella Ramsey and really everyone they had on there. And so I'm really pleased with the adaptation and I can't wait for season two. Yeah, I I feel like I don't have much more to, to add to that just because I, lo <laughs> I loved it too. It was so good. Like from the first like little like clips that we got, I was like, this like is breathing the 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 energy, the same like vibes as the game. And like, that's, I feel like all I could ask for. And then everything else on top of that is like a bonus for it being as good as it was like story wise, character wise, uh, cast wise, like it was just really, really satisfied. I think I can feel pretty confident in saying that this is the best video game adaptation uh that that we've gotten whether that's like animated movie live action uh tv show or movie i feel like this this is definitely the best until the mara movie comes out next month I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but i'll definitely agree with all you guys and i absolutely love the show i mean yeah definitely as far as I mean, we can we start getting details, but as far as being an adaption, I felt like when they did make changes, the changes made sense. They are warranted, mm -hmm. and they kept the stuff that people they kept the stuff that they knew people liked. I mean, there's a couple of gripes we could talk about, but um, I think overall, like you know, a lot of the struggle of like 
adapting a video game to a show or a movie is okay. And with the di- with, with, with the different medium, there's like inevitably, inevitably going to be some changes. So striking a balance between like changing certain things and keeping certain things the same, I thought the show did like really well. It's probably my favorite part about it. So um, uh, yeah, I guess uh, just sort of sort of diving in. Um, so I, how about we talk about like some of the performances first? So compared to, I guess we can talk about, how about we just start like with Joel and Ellie because they're the biggest ones, right? So how did we feel about like Joel and Ellie's like portrayals in the show versus the game? You know, did they feel super similar? Was it like jarring at first? Cause you know, they're, you know, repeating the same lines as other people. Did you feel like you know, their on-screen adaptions, like, were, like, a really good fit and, like, true to the game. How'd you guys feel about uh, Bella Ramsey and Pedro sort of, like, taking on roles that you had already seen sort of acted out already? I thought they did. Oh, yes. All the the awards. (laughs) All the awards. They did so good. Um, You know, the only thing I'd really seen Bella Ramsey in before this was Game of Thrones. And they did a really great job in that for how young they were. Well, really for anyone's age, but especially how young Bella was when they did that. But their acting in The Last of Us is just next level, I think. Mm-hmm. And at first I was like, well, I think Bella's playing off of Pedro really well, which is a talent in itself to be able to you know, keep up to par with an actor like Pedro, but even when Bella had scenes without him, they were fine on their own, like Mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal. And we're just so lucky. I think I feel like we're lucky to have Bella Ramsey and Pedro Pascal as these characters because I feel like they truly understand them and they're making them their own while staying respectful to the source. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I just like this entire time I've been thinking like what an absolute gift it is Mm -hmm. that we're getting like Pedro Pascal as Joel Miller. Like as soon as that, like, especially once you see the trailer, I was like, I can't imagine anyone else doing this. Mm -hmm. Cause I know that there Mm -hmm. were other fan casts that people had like Hugh Jackman just because of like Logan (laughs) and whatever. And I feel like the uh, the only other one that I would have been like cool with, I think was like Nikolai Coster Waldo Mm -hmm. from Game of Thrones um jamie lannister uh i was because we were i was watching an episode the other night and i was like you know what in another universe he probably would have been a pretty good joel miller but like just the like emotional additions that were made to to joel's character and how like pedro performed it wasn't great even like troy baker who played joel in the game kept saying like when he was watching he'd be like holy shit, like, I wish I made that decision. Like, that's so (laughs) smart. Like, that's so good. And so I love that, like, the original actors are also very accepting of the the new ones. And it's just, especially Bella Ramsey is just, like, Ellie, like, Mm -hmm. off the page. Like, she Mm -hmm. just, like, lives and breathes like Ellie. Like, it's so cool. Yeah, I remember when Bella got cast as ellie and my only experience with them was also uh game of thrones and i was like perfect no notes (laughs) right (laughs) perfect um and uh i there i don't think there's been a thing that pedro pascal has been in that i've watched that i haven't uh enjoyed him in so i Mm -hmm. I was you know i I was good wonder woman too Uh, he was he he, was the only good part he was was criminally underutilized in my opinion (laughs) um but uh i think i think the only other uh casting thing i saw that i was like oh that would have been interesting was mahershala ali Mm. Um, yeah yeah oh my gosh he he probably would have done a great job yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and then we would have had, you know, another round of uh, angry fan voice yeah. in a series wow. in a fandom full of angry very, fanboys. very many angry <laughs> fan boys. Mm-hmm. But we'll get there. <laughs> but yeah, no, Pedro, Emmy. Bella, Emmy. Yeah. Nick Offerman, Emmy. Yeah. Uh, all the Emmys all around. Yeah. Uh, I said as soon as um like episode seven and eight came out because that was like Bella was much more on their own Mm -hmm. as Ellie in those and I was like if anyone has any doubts after those two episodes about 
Bella Ramsey continuing on as Ellie in The Last of Us 2, I don't know what to tell you because yeah. they were incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I'd have to agree with you guys. No, really great performances. Um, And I think, you know, I think kind of what Pedro brought to Joel was that, like, when you're playing the video game, Joel's like Mr. Invincible Man. (laughs) But, like, in the the show, like, Pedro's Joel, like, people are complaining, like, oh, he's so much weaker in the show. But I feel like that almost... It, it, it was nice to kind of have a different take that this version of Joel like was weaker mm-hmm. and like was like, oh man, I messed up. You know, Ellie could have died then. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm not as strong as I used to be. I feel like mm-hmm. like adding that layer of like vulnerability to him that was in the show, I thought, I think, um, I, I think really helped. Ma- I, I think it made this adaption fit way more in a television mm-hmm. than it would than you could have in a video game because in a video game you're like playing the character so it's like well if you know what you're doing he'll never die yeah. and if they do die it's like it's on the player you know what i mean so mm-hmm. um yeah so i mean i definitely that that's something i definitely notice uh between the two i mean yeah i mean bella ramsey absolutely they just killed it and i'm excited to see um like Bella's take on on part two and some of the things that they do, um, because yeah, the especially yeah episode eight um, dealing with the cannibals and whatnot, um, you really got the see them like you know use like their acting chops and you know mm-hmm. show the fear and then also show like okay you know you got, you really got to see like the balance between you know a child that's afraid but also really smart and trying to figure out how to get out of the situation. I thought. Um, you know, I just saw that was really cool. Yeah, um, I think the I think the best episodes uh, of the series were seven and eight. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Bella Shining brings out so much more to the series than just uh, Pedro leading the way, um, mm-hmm. and and I think that's the natural progression of the series anyway. Yeah. If, if 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 you know you know, uh, <laughs> um, but it it's just so amazing to watch Bella shine, you know, yeah. to come out of that like oh like this is the wolf and the cub story, but no like the cub is actually going to shine um, as much if not more than the wolf in that same era of oh look I need to get cub from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things I was I was worried about going into the show because so many people were talking about Pedro, rightfully so. Um, but I was like, they they don't know yet that this is about Ellie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this right. is this is Ellie's story. Ellie is is the center of this, at the heart of this, even if maybe it doesn't seem like that at first. And um, and so I was worried that because Pedro Pascal is such a phenomenal actor that he would like outshine Ellie a little bit or outshine Bella. Um, And no, that didn't happen. They worked so well together and I'm so glad that, that um, it worked that way and that Bella has shown that they're completely ready to take on part two Ellie. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they're going to give, it is neither here nor there, but I wonder if they're going to give them, lifts to show that like hey they got older they're a little bit taller (laughs) you know i keep thinking about that but i'm like that's actually if i had to like criticize one thing about the games is like i've been the same height since (laughs) i was 12 years old (laughs) me too (laughs) and they made ellie so much taller in part two (laughs) i don't know why so i think her like bella's small size is not gonna be a big deal for the show but like I do wonder what they're going to do if they're going to, I mean, because Bella is like 19 or 20. So mm-hmm. technically, like, they are the right age to play Ellie in part two. So there's that. But, like, I wonder if they're going to do anything with, like, costuming or, like, hair and makeup to make her appear a little older. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious, too, because, like, in part two, like, there's, a, I mean, I want to. I don't want to spoil anything, right? But, like, in part two, there's some, like, you know, there's there's some more like there's some fist fighting and stuff that goes on and mm-hmm. things like that. So I'd be curious, especially with a person that like 
Ellie has to fight, you know, how yeah. that gets like choreographed. I think there would they, there has to be some changes there, but hopefully it's uh it's for the better. Which is also why you can't cast a certain transphobe as that character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> that on top believe. of the fact that she's like not supposed to be forty years old. Yeah, I was gonna <laughs> that, say y'all like, well, even 40. was that. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, yeah, no, let's totally have the forty-year-old play the twenty-three-year-old. That makes sense. <laughs> this is the nineties. Uh, but um, what, so one thing what, I want to talk about. So instead of like going through every episode chronologically, how about we talk about? We can talk about how about our favorite episodes, our favorite like. You know, scenes or changes. And I mean, I can definitely start. So for sure, uh, episode three, um, like it was a departure from the game, right? So the game, like it's t pretty much totally different. So like in the game, you like go to meet Bill and like his town, you know, Bill's like a prepper. So his town's got like a ton of like funky traps and whatnot. So like in a game, it gives you like some fun puzzles and things of that nature. But in the show, they decided to pretty much give you an entire episode with this whole side story with uh, Bill and Frank, you know? So, you know, it was implied in the game that, like, Bill was, like, my partner, but, you know, the game came out, what, 2013? So, like, they didn't ex explicitly state things back then. So in the show, they are very, like, you know, in the show, they are like, okay, you know, Bill and Frank, they're gay, they're together, you know, and they're, you know, he meets Frank, he's suspicious at first, and eventually they bond and whatnot. And you get to see them living for like, what, 15 years, I think, you know, oh, just yeah. quite a while. And I thought like, the whole episode was like, it was very, emo very emotional, it was very moving, you know, and since it, this wasn't in the game at all, you know, I had no idea what was going to happen. And like, it was, I mean, I thought it was really cool because, like, you rarely get – how often do you get stories of, like, like older gay men, you know, just, like, living their lives and being happy and, you know, eating the strawberries and whatnot. And, like, you know, compared to most folks who live in that universe, they were probably close to the happiest except for – um Maybe some folks who are out in uh like out in Jackson, at least for now. So um yeah. Yeah. Yeah, was definitely episode three was definitely a standout for me. For sure. Yeah. I saw uh people talking online too, like about the since they had the outbreak is in two thousand and three in the show versus the game, which is twenty thirteen, like uh mentioned like when you talked about them being like older gay men it's like not only have they survived this like zombie apocalypse but they're also like coming from the aids epidemic from like mm -hmm. the 80s and so it has mm -hmm. like even more kind of meaning to it that they've you know made it this far yeah and at the time because in this the cordyceps starts in 2003 mm -hmm. so uh sodomy and anti uh, homosexual laws were still on the books in many states upwards to around 20 um obergefell didn't get uh that case wasn't decided for marriage equality until 2015 mm -hmm. um so for their entire lives i don't want i don't know how old bill is in this adaptation i want to assume he's like in his late 30s or early 40s but for most of his life and probably you know for frank's too being gay is a death sentence yeah yeah that was the first episode that i really like i sat down afterwards and was like i i, I don't know like i can't i had to process it because the first and second episodes were great and they were fun or fun, you know, emotional, <laughs> but episode three, I genuinely, like I was, I felt like carved out of um, inside out. And I just sat there for a while and was like, Oh my God, I can't, I can't believe that they did that. They did this in a good way. And I just, it just felt so beautiful to have something that was originally so full of hate, which was Bill and Frank's relationship in the mm. game and turn it into something that was so full of love and hope and promise of something. And I thought that that was the best change they could have made and probably my favorite change they made throughout the season. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And there's like Bill and Frank's story perfectly like and beautifully parallel Joel and Ellie's mm -hmm. as well, which I love that even though they changed it so much from the game, they still tied it into all of the main themes mm -hmm. that they were trying to get across. Um, and I feel like the game in the game, Bill is like a cautionary tale for like what Joel could turn into. Mm -hmm. um, but then the, the show was like, nah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to show what, like what Joel could turn into, but like in the best way instead mm -hmm. of the worst yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, also Bill's note. Um, mm -hmm. Although he's, you know, just like laying things out for Joel, he knows it's Joel that's going to be there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, obviously there's that, that chord that struck with, you know, he's, you know, talking about Tess. Um, but, we all know what happened there. So now that's sort of, you know, instead of being in a uh, loving romantic relationship, now you have this loving familial relationship. And then, you know, Bill puts in the, yeah, there are probably a bunch of dead bodies around for my traps. <laughs> like I, I could just hear, I was just like, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. The way Bella read that too was just so perfect because mm -hmm. like did 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 Bella study how Nick Offerman would say that? Because yeah. that's so perfect. Yeah. Uh I think my favorite episode, but also the one that probably hurt the most for me personally was uh episode five. Mm -hmm. Um <sighs> Endure and Survive. Yeah. Uh just Oh, Sam and Henry. And making uh, them younger, it just, it hurt, it hurt harder. And Ellie trying to save him with, by, you know, she's like, well, I, I'm bitten, but maybe if I use my blood and then. I love that change, too, mm -hmm. that they made, mm -hmm. like, the fact that Ellie made Sam feel safe and like comfortable enough to actually tell her that he was bitten instead of in the yeah. game he's very like closed off about it and doesn't tell anyone like ugh, it's so good I think that's why then sharing the bond of Savage Starlight which again is another change um mm -hmm. was so important because they had that connection Sam finally had this connection with someone else you know, closer to his age and uh, someone whose who's responsibility wasn't to look after him and who could connect with him on a friend, friend level instead of a protector level. Mm. And to have that connection and feel safe is, is all, all he wanted. And that's what Ellie gave him. And I think that I, I, it's sad that, that she couldn't see that she did give him that, even though she couldn't save him, she did give him a sense of safety and that was just my second favorite change, I think, was the the whole everything with Sam and Henry and Ellie. Mm -hmm. And then her I'm sorry. God. On the little etch et yeah. sketch. I was like, oh, yeah. why y'all had to do this to me? I really like their change yeah. with Henry, too. Because Henry mm. was very much, like, not as nice <laughs> in the game. Like, he was, he he was, was more still like about Joel. the same. Yes, he was definitely more like Joel. He was more like overprotective of Sam, but in a way that it's like forgetting that Sam is also still a child. And not only do you have to protect their, you know, physical safety, but also like their emotional safety. And cause he's, I mean, in the, in the show, he was eight years old, but even in the mm -hmm. game, he's only like 12 or 11 mm -hmm. or something. And I like that they changed that, that instead of being like, oh, we only take what we need. It's like, no, here's this giant bag of crayons that I carry around for my brother because I know that it's going to make him feel happy in this world where there's nothing happy anymore. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you add on to that, that, you know, if uh, that Henry is probably in his late teens or early mm -hmm. 20s. Yeah. So when this all started he was either born into this or mm -hmm. he only has a few years of being a kid before the world ended. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now he's taking, he's, you know, trying to make sure that he may not have had that opportunity. We don't know, but he's going to make sure that Sam has it. Yeah. 
it adds a lot of weight that they also made sure to say that Henry had never killed anyone or mm -hmm. really committed any act of violence and like doesn't work so much in a video game setting because otherwise you're just carrying around like an extra useless NPC, NPC yeah. you know yeah. like it makes more sense that you have someone that can help like you fight your enemies but in the show like it makes what happens at the end of that episode with Sam like hurt so much more <laughs> mm -hmm. and going to Kathleen it's a it's, it's a great story uh narratively about revenge yeah and the lengths mm -hmm. people go to which will uh inspire or mm, foreshadow interesting, interesting. things <laughs> in, in, in later things but i think um what, what what was interesting was i think it was at the end of episode four you see that sort of like the the cordyceps like uh um tendrils in the ground and like things moving and i'm just like you you might want to deal <laughs> with that yeah. like no <laughs> Yeah, but no, she doomed everyone, yeah. and they were all loyal to her no matter what. So they were, mm -hmm. they were, they were some ride or dies. Yeah. They definitely died, but they were. Some <laughs> ride or dies. I like that sequence too, where like you know the infected comes out and like pretty much destroys their like military because I think like like episode five was probably like the the episode where you got to see like how terrifying the infected like were because it's like you have this whole you have all these military guys they got tanks and all this stuff and they're like they go down like paper when they're dealing with the infected so it makes you realize like no there's a reason why like you know everything's screwed up and like everything's destabilized because like humans don't really have an anything that can combat like the hordes of infected you know mm -hmm. in a way so i i mean yeah so i I did appreciate that. Finally got a bloater. The um, big boy. Yeah. <laughs> it's my Instagram bestie. You yeah. Me on Instagram. <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw that. It's so weird, but now he likes all my posts. 80 pounds worth of prosthetics. That's, yeah. They wild. ended up like cover, like doing CGIing it instead, but like even mm. just having that is so cool. Yeah. Mm. But. You know, just and then it doing the finisher from the game. Yeah. And I was like the Leo DiCaprio. Oh my like, god! Yeah. I yeah. was so I was like, that's what I love so much about this show is that the meat, like the the things that aren't important to the narrative, but are like just little things from the game that they chose to include. Yeah, just makes me so happy. Like Joel constantly having to like boost people up off of like yeah. onto walls. Mm -hmm. It's like they purposely showed that for us. For us game fans, you know, mm -hmm. and that was the first episode with a uh, video game actor. You had a video game uh, Tommy, who's like the Pierce. second in command yeah. of yeah. the Rebels. Yeah, and he he's the one who gets ripped apart. So yeah, mm -hmm. yep, yeah, yep. They I just, gave you know, they they gave all the actors from the game like a special a special send off. Yeah, and they yeah, all they died. Did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, I just realized, I'm like, yeah, they all, yeah, yeah, it's all pretty brutal. Yeah. Uh, the ch uh, I can't uh, not talk about this episode and say the child clicker. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're doing the gymnastics yeah, in the, in the. I'm like, I, I'm terrified now. Yeah, <laughs> please, please leave. Because <laughs> I don't think they were, like, child infected, like, in the game, aside from Sam, right? Yeah, you don't really see. You don't them, really don't fighting, think. which makes sense that no. they don't really want you like, you know, hurting yeah. children, even if they're infected. But yeah, in the show, that was it was really creepy for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, I had the idea. I was like, well, what if you know a parent couldn't bring themselves? I told Brooke this: a parent couldn't bring themselves to kill their infected child, so they just kind of like lock them in the basement, and someone comes upon it. It's like child bloater now. <laughs> <laughs> that's what no so that was the back story they gave for tess um her husband and son were bitten mm. and she shot her husband but she couldn't shoot her son and so she just locked him up and left because she couldn't she couldn't bear to do it and that was the backstory they gave her in their own minds and they thought about including it in the show 
but they mm -hmm. decided not to, that that might be a bit too, a bit too much. <laughs> That kid is probably a bloater now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> or beyond is if there's anything beyond a bloater, we don't know. Because if that was at the beginning, now it's about 20 years past. And yeah. bloaters are like, what, 10? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I will say I like, like how the show overall handled the infected. I know one of the complaints I've seen is that they wish people wish that there were more infected, or they don't think that there were enough like in, infected encounters, like because in the game they're all over the place. Yeah. Um, but and I was just listening to the podcast this morning on my way to work, and um, with uh, both the creators and Troy Baker hosting, it's like that HBO official Last of Us podcast, and they were basically saying like we hope to include like more infected in next season. This season they were ma mainly focused on just creating them for live action and making sure that they work and they don't look like corny or dumb or like that they were faithful to the game, but also made them like feel like a real threat in the world that we live in. Um, and I think like, I have a TikTok I made about this cause someone called me brain dead. Uh, <laughs> first because someone complained about their not being infected in the finale like because mm -hmm. in in the last part of the game you come across a like a bunch of infected and like two giant bloaters this guy was like they didn't include that in the finale so it was dumb and i was like <laughs> what i said what part of the narrative would that serve like it doesn't yeah. and then he called me brain dead anyway uh, <laughs> I I think back to like playing the game for the first time and experiencing like what do I remember about the infected the most? I remember um, experiencing like seeing a clicker for the first time mm -hmm. and how like terrifying it was to like have to get around it or like go up to it. And that's what they did in episode two. It was like they really made it scary. And it's like in the game you can take down a bunch of infected really easily, but we saw how hard that three of them struggled to get just two of them yeah. in the mm -hmm. museum. And like Tess was bitten anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it, it kind of upped the stakes. And then obviously episode five, because we had a few episodes there where we didn't really get infected. And then it was like, Hey, remember us? We're a zombie show. <laughs> and I think it was really effective too. Cause that's like, I also remember the first time you encounter a bloater. It's like, what the, <laughs> fuck is that um and so i think they recreated those moments really well and the other infected encounters i feel like aren't necessarily as important to the narrative like in episode seven it's very important that there's you know a, a infected in the mall um in the game there's like a, a bunch more but i like that they just changed it to one Mm -hmm. singular thing and it even ties into um the part of the left behind dlc that they didn't show which yeah. is cool so like the dlc has the present and then the past so it has the all the riley and ellie stuff but then it also has a section where you're trying to find um supplies and medicine to help joel and you go into an abandoned mall um so they kind of parallel each other mm -hmm. and um you find out that the the pharmacist in them i don't know why there's a pharmacy in the mall but there was uh, the pharmacist got like infected and they locked him in the store next door which is like this creepy doll store and so they still tied it back into the show is that that infected came out of the creepy doll store mm -hmm. um and uh i just think like overall all of the choices they made for the infected make sense to me and i think sure i would have liked to see more of them because they're really cool but it was never about the infected anyway like the story is always about the people and um that i feel like is what's more important there's also like so much of the environmental storytelling like they show in the shot like how many desolate buildings there are how mm -hmm. like how these places got bombed like that all goes into like it being an apocalyptic world it's like you have the threat of the infected but you also like we don't have cars anymore we don't have technology anymore we don't have science anymore like science advancements if you get sick with something else like what are you going to do 
Like mm. there's no it's hospital you it, can yeah. go to. So I feel like that also adds to like the weight of, especially at the end when you think about like, could we have saved humanity or not? I think um, the only uh, place I would have put infected that they're not there, it would have been in episode eight uh, where uh, David and Ellie are talking mm. just for the mm. simple passage of time part because uh, what's his face goes four miles and back real quick. <laughs> like well, at the beginning of the conversation, he leaves and at the end of the conversation, he's back. So I feel like if you had did not as drawn out as it is in the game, because you had to kill like 30 plus infected yeah. and then you run into the like warehouse or it, whatever and then you have to kill a bloater. I yeah. would have just did maybe like 10 infected are running at them and they have to mm -hmm. like, you know, hold them off for a little bit and then they have the conversation. Mm -hmm. What it well and what it does also in the game, like in the game, you like team up with David to take out some infected, like the very beginning. Yeah, so it's sort, sort of trust they're, him. they're sort of there. So you're like, can I trust this guy? Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like in the show, they're like, nah, this guy's a creep. <laughs> mm -hmm. From like the first ten seconds, so I think that narratively they're a little different. I also think too. One thing I want to talk about really quick was, you know, I, I was thinking that like if you were gonna add some, maybe episode nine, but also the way they structured the show, maybe not because like in the game, like like in the beginning when you have Ellie, Joel's fighting and he's like, okay, Ellie, go hide in a corner. But towards the end, as they as they bond and Ellie becomes a better fighter, like in your like final battles with the infected, Ellie's actually like she's able to use a gun. She's able to actually help you you know, a lot more and they're working together as a team fighting. But since the show didn't focus on that as much, you know, it's, it was just kind of a choice they made, I feel like for the show itself. So mm -hmm. just like throwing infected in there just to have something, I feel like doesn't work unless, you know, you're kind of like, like in the game there, you know, they, it, it, it's short in the game, they helped show you like, you know, how tight the bond between Joe and Ellie got towards the end and how much more capable Ellie was, especially after, mm -hmm. You know, Joel, uh, you know, Joel's like KO'd for a little while. So, yeah. Yeah, I think they could have maybe shown that Ellie's growth in her, like, capabilities uh, in, like, the when they go to the university, because that's another part. Mm -hmm. That's, like, in the game, it's not infected, but she has to get rid of more of the, like, more of David's guys, or who we find out to be David's guys, like, as she's helping Joel, like, get out of the of the school building or whatever. Um, but I like don't feel that strongly about it. Yeah. I think that leaving out her killing or getting rid of a bunch of the men was very intentional on their part, mm -hmm. because I think mm -hmm. they wanted to put a lot of emphasis on the, the impact that killing David has on her. Yeah. And sure. um, that, amplifies so much more when she's not really killed that many people before mm -hmm. and uh when she has it or the last person that she actually killed was riley and um i just think it adds it adds a little bit more so i see why they did that but i also yeah. do see wanting more infected um it's not a complaint i have but i i think that they'll definitely get there with season two yeah doesn't lessen the show by any mm -hmm. means for me but like having too much could have lessened the show yeah mm -hmm. definitely um, yeah i feel like one thing the show did too is that like all the things a lot of things that were sort of left up in the air from the game the show just stated outright the show's like yeah no joel and tess yeah no they were a thing yes bill's <laughs> gay and then you know even like with um what you know in the left behind storyline you're sort of like you know you don't know exactly what happens you know after uh riley and ellie get bitten it's like oh no had to kill Riley. You're like, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, definitely just... things are more explicit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I will say, if even if you did know Bill and Frank were a couple, if you didn't know Bill was gay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you didn't. You just like the cutscene came on and you just stopped paying. Skipped it, right? Yeah. Yeah. One of the no best cutscenes. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because you like has some magazine. Why are these pages stuck together? Why are these all dudes like? <laughs> right. I'm so glad they ended up including that in the show because I remember mm. like watching episode three. I was like, that was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. But also I want to see <laughs> the magazine scene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I loved that scene, but it also made me I'm so glad they included it. And I think that Bella and Pedro 
did their own little twist on it. Mm -hmm. But it made me even more appreciative of the fact that they were very uh, intentional with what they kept word for word Mm -hmm. and that they didn't just do it to do it because I think some of their best moments are when they have their creative freedom Mm -hmm. uh, away from the exact adaptation of it, the exact, you know, word for word adaptation. And so I loved it, but I think that was the moment where I was like, I love this. I'm glad they included it, but I'm also glad that they're going off script a lot for this. I I will say I would have liked to see Bella and Nick Offerman play off of each other, not necessarily (laughs) in like the way they are in the game, but just the two of them as actors being able to just like have that kind of banter uh, because (laughs) I would, I will say, I mean, granted it's different because Frank left Bill in the game, but Bill isn't bitter at the, at this point. So it would have just been interesting just to see them, you know, duke it out a little bit, but also like Bill would have loved this Ellie. Someone asked Dick Offerman about it, and he said, I think it would have been like a Ron Swanson April Ludgate relationship, which, yeah, my Parks and Rec heart. I was so excited because it just it made me think about that scene where Ron Swanson is like talking about if you need to like take a man down a peg, like you call him by the wrong name, and then April just goes, You're welcome, Lester. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I can just see them doing that, <laughs> something like that, yeah. I feel like uh, before we get to uh, the finale, um, we have to talk about people's inability to or or their lack of media literacy when it when it comes to this show and how a lot of the complaints from a certain demographic. uh, Well, actually, I can think of several demographics, especially after the David episode uh, that are upset. (laughs) with this show and i feel like they're missing the point which will tie into the finale but i just feel like this is an apocalypse guys there is no morals yeah the world sucks yeah i think that's that's what makes the last of us as a story so intriguing and also really difficult for people to engage with fully, I think, because in order to engage with it fully, you have to accept being uncomfortable. You have to accept your thoughts and your beliefs being challenged and being okay with that and being willing to look at things from different perspectives. And not a lot of people want to do that. And that's okay. But I feel like you don't get the most out of the story if you don't allow yourself to be uncomfortable. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought that that's my favorite part about it. And I love seeing how people approach it differently because I approach it differently every single time I play the game, every single time I experience the story, I come away with a different understanding of everyone's choices, a different understanding of Joel's choices, of how Ellie's feeling. And I, I have to remind myself of that though. So like when I see people feeling the way I felt when I first played the game, I have to remind myself that's a natural reaction to it. And that's, a valid reaction to it and you know they might change their minds if they play or watch it again and they might not and that's a part of that's just a part of the story yeah well said oh. see danielle no danielle's underappreciated in the community she's a goat <laughs> <laughs> um before we get to the finale one thing i wanted to talk about really quick was uh um, episode six, where they go to Jackson, I felt like that was the, uh, I felt like since like part two already exists, they were able to use that to like plant a lot of Easter eggs, you know, yeah. for things that will happen in the future. But I, was like, I feel like that was probably the most fan servicey episode, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. I thought all, I thought that was pretty cool. And I also like the, uh, the joke about them being communists. Because like, uh, yeah, rarely, so rarely in American media do you ever get like a positive portrayal of any sort of like socialist, mm-hmm. communist society. And for the most part, out of all the groups of people that we meet, they're pretty much doing the best as far as like mm-hmm. 
having any sort of sense of like normalcy where they're like, yeah, well, we've got a movie night and, you know, <laughs> we all just like live here and, you know, no one's poor and everyone's happy and this is great. And you're just like, <laughs> you're just like, yeah, it would be, that would be like the ideal situation in like a world like that. So I just, yeah. I appreciate yeah. that episode. And it was a nice breather until Joel gets uh, KO'd at the end. Cause I haven't seen <laughs> yeah. that episode, I think. Yeah. 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 Awesome. I- Go ahead, bro. I was just going to say, I think like uh, episode six and episode after coming away from episode eight, um, like complement each other really well. You can see Mm -hmm. like you have one community that is, you know, they're a collective and they're, you know, sharing everything and like, you know, compared them to communists because basically that's what it is. And they're like thriving. And I think, um, then you have episode eight and you've got this like and the fact that they included um which wasn't in the game that uh david was like a became like a preacher and like was preaching yeah. things from the bible and it's like they live in this like desolate place that they're all starving and they're resorting to literally cannibalism and stuff and it's like crazy the contrast between the two societies yeah, I um, I also think that one moment in episode six where my entire timeline was like, was that Dina? It was trending on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Druckmann um, tweeted like a screenshot of like trending now. Was that Dina in all caps? And he was like, <laughs> he was I like, love you guys. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I love I love that. And Baby Shimmer, Baby Shimmer should have trended yeah. too <laughs> i guess screamed when i saw yeah. baby although <laughs> this is like not uh a compl- like a serious complaint but <laughs> they never said the horse's name that they take i know in mm-hmm. the show it's callous i love that it's callous because like yes. i think uh, ellie's like what kind of name is that or one of them says like what kind of name is that joel joel does <laughs> yeah <laughs> but my complaint is that i was trying i was reading a couple like fan fictions and people were calling the horse that they were riding on Shimmer, and I'm like, that's not no, Shimmer. Not that's yet. Callus. <laughs> I loved that. So in the game, Joel says, um, "What? Yeah, he's the one who says, what kind of name is that?'" And then he he mutters at some point, "I hate that name. I can't stand that name." <laughs> and then the fact that Troy Baker is the one who shoots Callus, mm-hmm. I was like, I guess he really did hate that. I felt name. sad when the horse died. I was like, oh, yeah, R.I.P good horse yeah i will say in a universe like that would there be more there'd be way more wild animals i feel like right because like the infected don't care about like animal life for the most part so would like would add would animals like breed more and like you know would there be more like wildlife in a world like that about that because i've also like before the last of us i was like i need to consume any zombie things so i started watching the walking dead for the first time and it's like I feel like The Walking Dead is completely the opposite of that because mm-hmm. like the the walkers just eat anything that is alive and moves. So you'd think that like there would be so much less wildlife, but I feel like I guess there would be more. I mean, we kind of see that at the end with the giraffes too. Yeah. So it's like this is a population that's been like thriving for how long? Yeah. Yeah. In what the- would the lions have done? You know, yeah. like. Yeah. In in part two, see, this is interesting, and this is why I like. They, they have changed the way that the infected work more than just, you know, spores and how they pass on things and everything. Because in the game, it's not really clear, like, the infected are eating. They're not necessarily just trying to spread. They are eating. And so in, in part mm-hmm. two, there's a scene where they've been eating a, a, a moose. And, mm. um, and so... I think it's different in the show now that they've, you know, stated that the soul, the main purpose of the cordyceps mm-hmm. is to spread, uh, not necessarily to consume. I wonder if if that kind of changes how things would they attack an animal or would they not? Didn't mean to go on tangent. I was just, I was curious. Yeah, sorry. Was like, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, well, there just be deer. I feel like they'd be deer <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. But. I- I also don't know what the population of, of deer are at, at that <laughs> point in like here in Michigan. Oh yeah. It'd be all over the place. Yeah, and whereas yeah, we live in Michigan, so we see deer normally. So I'm like 20 years of like 
you know, I mean, they're obviously they're hunting, but like I would think not to the extent that hunting happens now. So, mm -hmm. Right. They're yeah. just be like, <laughs> the deer just take over anyway. But speaking, but speaking of science, this is a, a almost perfect segue into the finale. The science that is explained in the first two episodes via the uh, cold opens were just phenomenal, frightening. Uh, they they set the stage for the world really well. Mm -hmm. Um I think I, I can't pick which one was better. They're just they're both yeah. ten out of ten. I think the opening for the first episode was the best possible opening they could have for the season. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, so good. Stroke of genius. And uh, it's just a, it goes to show like because Neil Druckmann didn't want to do that, but Craig Mazin kind of pushed for it. Mm -hmm. And I love that you have this you have Neil Druckmann kind of making sure that the story stays true to the to the heart of, of the story. And then you have Craig Mazin who knows how to do TV and who yes. knows how to how to like get TV audiences. Oh, God, yeah. I love it. They work so well together. And that was just a phenomenal inclusion. Yeah. That is probably one of my like favorite things about the whole show. And I like almost forgot about it because it's been so long since we yeah. got the first episode. But it's just like so brilliant. And it gives you like the perfect exposition for like what the universe is going to look like for mm -hmm. general audiences. Um, because a lot of people who never played the game or know nothing about the game are like, yeah, I'm going to watch that new show, that zombie show with Pedro Pascal. And like, that's yeah. all they know about it. And it's like, it's so much more than that. And like, yeah. <laughs> I have a degree and I have like a science degree as well. So I was like, oh my God, this is so cool hearing them like yeah. talk about it. And I think what makes, other than just the narrative, what makes The Last of Us cool as far as like zombie type media is that it is something that's so grounded in real science. Like cordyceps is like a real fungus, like yeah. the zombie fungus, it, it infects ants, not and insects, not people. But like, it's so, it's like, what if it did? It's so cool. Like, this is how it would act in humans. Now, would it turn humans into like living, breathing zombies that can run and flail their body around? I don't know. But like, it's just so cool. And then they had to tie it into climate change on top of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were like, well, what if the temperature, the average temperature of the earth, like increased a couple degrees? I was like, <laughs> amazing. So yeah. good. Yeah. So scary. Oh, man. I liked um I don't I don't know if it was the second or third episode where you had the the woman the 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 woman that was a scientist and they're like mm -hmm. so what should we do and she's like bomb them bomb, bomb everything yep. bomb yeah. everything and people and I think people were like I saw TikToks and people I think they were taking audio I think it was like a Fox News segment or something like that where this woman was like bomb them you know I'm just like oh my god oh yeah 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 you know oh, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. liked it. it got us like other parts of the world too. Cause mm -hmm. I, one of my complaints about things like zombie things, it's like, why are they always in the South? They're always like Southern American United, yeah. like United States. I'm like, I want to see more than Georgia, yeah. you know? <laughs> Cause they're the ones with the guns, Brooke. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we watched so many seasons of The Walking Dead and I'm like, I just want them to go somewhere else. Cool. <laughs> but it would be interesting to see other parts of the world or parts of the world that are densely populated within you know like we think of like our big cities here that have you know uh maybe like a million people oh my God, yeah like what does mumbai like, look like mm -hmm. right in yeah this or, or beijing universe. like if something mm -hmm. breaks out yeah. i think the closest we've gotten to that is world war z yeah would be the yeah. closest yeah, um that's true. yeah but yeah uh Let's get into that finale. Yeah, let's get into the finale. Yeah. That so. will have no future consequences at all. <laughs> no, it's so it's such a disappointment that this is just a limited series and that we're never gonna yeah. know what happens after. Yeah. They're just gonna go to Jackson and live happily ever after forever. It's gonna right? be fine. All right. <laughs> Ellie's gonna be an auntie to, you know, Tommy, Tommy's kid. You know, it's just gonna yeah. be a great time. Are we gonna want me to set the stage for the for the set debate? The Set the stage. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, in the last episode, uh, Joel and Ellie, they're pretty much um, where they need to be. They get knocked out by some gas. And then Marlene, who we haven't seen since the first episode, is telling Joel, like, okay, so uh, Ellie's, um, you know, Ellie's got, we can make a vaccine if we uh, do surgery on Ellie. 
Um, and uh, by the way, that'll kill her because we have to get in her brain for the uh, the quarterzats. And then uh, and then they're, and then she's like, Joel, you gotta go. I've got these guys with guns that escort you out. Of course, Joel's not happy because at this point he's like bonded with Ellie um, and effectively sees her as his replacement daughter after you know his actual you know because he hasn't gotten over his you know blood daughter dying at the beginning of the show. Um, so Joel ends up killing all the guards um, in the hospital. He ends up killing a guy as like surrendering, which was uh was really sad. And then he goes into the operating room with the operator on Ellie and he shoots the doctor immediately who will not be important at all <laughs> later. <laughs> no, it's just some guy. <laughs> um, and takes Ellie, takes Ellie out of the hospital, uh, confronts Marlene, I guess, no, the parking lot, parking structure. Mm -hmm. Um, she's like pleading for him not to, you know, for, she's like, she's like begging him to like let Ellie go. And, um, he doesn't. And, they leave. Ellie wakes up. She's like, yo, what happened? And Joel pretty much tells her a lie. They're like, oh, yeah, the cure doesn't work. Um, and we're, we're just going to we're going to leave. And I mean, Ellie knows that Joel's lying. Um, she confronts him so, like in the like final scenes. And Joel's like, oh, yeah, no, I swear I was telling the truth. And it was a situation where Joel's lying. Ellie knows he's lying, but she's not really you know, I don't know if you want to say she's in a place to confront him, but effectively, you know, it kind of ends with her, you know, she says, okay, but you can tell that she knows like he's full of shit and none of this will be important later at all. So <laughs> like, this is probably like the, so we, we now get to relitigate the debate that video game players had like a decade <laughs> ago, which is like, did Joel do the right thing? What would you have done? Is it worth it to potentially sacrifice one person to like create a vaccine that could save humanity, et cetera? And there's like a billion different angles. People have uh, looked at this over uh, to this day. So this is just an open floor to just talk about it. Um, yeah, this is a safe space. I guess. My first thing is we always see people talking about the validity of the vaccine. If it was possible, if it wasn't possible. And to me, that's just, that's not the point of Joel's part in this story because it doesn't matter to Joel if it's possible or not. He couldn't care less. All he cares about is Ellie. And I actually think that trying to argue that the vaccine isn't possible takes a, as a reason for why Joel was right in what he was doing actually takes away the power of his choice because if he believes that there's even a small chance that Ellie could be the cure, he's willing to give up that to save her. And regardless of whether you view that as right or wrong, that is the power behind his choice. And that is the point of this like last part of the story. And, um, and so I, I really, I really don't like when people focus on that. <laughs> I understand wanting to know and wanting to like from, especially like is this, if you have a science-minded um, brain or like you think like to think like that. I understand wanting to, to unpack that, but I don't think it is really conducive to anything that has to do with like Joel's decision, because his priority is and always will be Ellie in his life. And um, I don't, I don't disagree with his decision. Do I would probably do the same thing. Now, when it comes to him lying to Ellie, that's where things get, I think that's where the real interesting debate is because mm -hmm. I think almost anyone would probably want to save the person that they view as the person they need to be protecting. But would you lie to them or not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of view, because my, I feel similarly with my biggest issue with the whole thing is Joel lying to Ellie. Mm -hmm. Now we'll never know what what would have happened if he had told her the truth, but I kind of see it like going all the way back to the prologue with episode one, like Joel's a protector. That's how he expresses his love. And he was protecting Sarah in the best way he could. Like as soon as she gets out of the car, he's like, I'm going to pick you up. Don't look anywhere, but me. Cause like, I'm your, like I'm you're safe here with me as long as you don't look at me. And he's trying to shield her from all of this, like horror of what's happening outside. So I view like him lying to Ellie in that moment is the, in the same way if he's trying to shield her from the horror of this thing. Cause he knows like what he did was horrific, you know, like the 
innocent people, innocent or not, whatever you want to call them. Like, I think in his mind, at least that was his way of shielding her from that in a way and still trying to protect her. So I think he was also shielding himself. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Because I, I think, I think he knew that if he told her the truth, I think he, he was afraid of what she would do and that mm-hmm. if he told her the truth, her choice wouldn't be him in that mm-hmm. moment. And mm-hmm. this is where like, I was thinking the other night, this is what I mean when like, every time I think about this story, I, I have different perspectives and I have different stuff because I've never thought of it this way before that Joel is coming at his relationship with Ellie from the experience of being a father. And when he sees someone, when he sees Ellie and he puts her in the position of daughter, it's automatically okay for him to act like a father towards her. And I think that any father or any parent figure would feel that way. But Ellie has never had a parent before. Mm -hmm. And she has been the person looking after herself for her entire life up until this point. And so for Ellie, I think it's very natural for her to look at what he did or what she suspects he did and think, what right do you have to that Mm -hmm. in my life? I didn't give you permission to have that right in my life. And that's the tragedy of it because they were a couple episodes before at the same level in their relationship. And from that point on, they are never at that equal level again, Mm -hmm. but that same understanding of who they are to each other. And that is, it's just so painful. It's so, (laughs) it hurts so much. Yeah, the way they showed the whole hospital scene too, like Joel's definitely shielding himself from what he did because the way that they showed it is like, instead of really focusing on like how loud the gunshots were or like how loud Mm. the people would be screaming, like the sound was muted and the music was sad. It wasn't like this high level action music. It was like, and I was listening to the podcast and they said they made all of those choices intentionally because it's almost like Joel is dissociating in that moment. Like he, Mm it's outside of himself like he is not he's conscious of what he's doing but he's taking all of the parts that would like tell him not to do this because it's you know he might think it's like morally wrong to kill a bunch of people or whatever you want to whatever you want to get into it um like he's just associating because that's what he has to do is he has to anything that he can do to save ellie that's what's important in the moment And I hope that they kind of explore that maybe in season two, like how Mm -hmm. Joel feels about about it. The part with the knife, when he runs out of bullets and he pulls Ellie's knife out and then just the absolute blank. Yeah. I don't give it like, or uh, not even really blank. It'd be like, yeah, I'm going to do this. Right. The night out, knife out. And that was haunting. Like, I think that will haunt me for a long time. Such good acting. Yeah, even him uh, go walking into the the surgery room and just like not even thinking mm-hmm. twice about just shooting like, the surgeon because mm-hmm. like when you're playing the game, <laughs> you you can stand there as long as you want and well, like you have likes to, to use kill the flamethrower. Yeah, the flamethrower. Well, yeah. yeah. You well, have not... to kill him to progress the game, but like you could stand there as long as you want. But the yeah. show, they were just like, nope, not a nope. second thought. immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's not even looking at him. Right. When he does it, yeah. I also think that the fact that they included how he was hurt um, beforehand and how he mm-hmm. almost took his own life, but he mm-hmm. flinched is important narratively because if he loses Ellie, like he lost Sarah, he's not he, going to flinch this not time. Flinch. Yeah. So right. he, you know, so uh, there's that also added layer. Um, and I, and I think, and I know you both have talked about this, uh, on Twitter, uh, and probably on TikTok, but I haven't been, uh, y'all haven't been on my FYP lately. Uh, so, um, I feel like you you really don't, (laughs) uh, it's been a lot of South Park. Um, but that they took, er everybody took Ellie's choice away. Um, the fireflies started at first. I don't think at that point joel like in the hospital joel could have even gotten ellie's opinion because she's drugged up and the only way he would have gotten to her is to kill everybody and then just sit there and wait Mm -hmm. and that wasn't gonna happen so but then when he lies to her he takes away that choice yeah 
uh, from her. And but, well, do you know what I've been wondering lately is I think a lot about how Joel is both selfish and selfless when it comes to Ellie. Mm-hmm. And there's room for both of those things to coexist in his mm-hmm. actions. And when we go back to episode six, when he gives Ellie a choice to go with him or go with Tommy, um, he knows what she's going to choose. Mm-hmm. He knows she's going to choose him. And so it's easy for him to give her that choice because he gives her that choice knowing that they will both get what they want at the end of it. Mm-hmm. I can't help but wonder if he would give Ellie this choice knowing that there's a very real possibility that she would say yes. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And, and I hate thinking that because Joel, like I said, I love Joel. I attached to him. He's my father. Mm -hmm. Um, But I can't help but wonder if, if he would ever give her that choice. If he even had time to do that, if he'd had the, the means to, give her the option he knows that she would probably there's a very high chance that she would say yes and i don't think he would be willing to risk that i wonder uh oh we have sue uh coming in oh we have someone hey. coming in yes last minute for the uh for the, <laughs> for the big finale talk for the finale. Hi. Hey. Uh, how are um, you guys Sorry, I couldn't join earlier. <laughs> uh, it's it's okay. That's 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 my fault. I I communicated in my brain, but no one else oh. is up here. Um, <laughs> no, I, I totally get it. <laughs> so we're we're talking about the finale right now. But before we get there, uh, introduce yourself. Let people know where they can find you, and then talk about uh, your favorite episode of the series. Oh, that's a tough one. Okay, so I'm Fuhela. Um, you can find me at Fuh Theories on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. I mainly do live reactions, some random theories, and earrings um, as I'm watching shows. Um, favorite episode? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Every single one I would watch and be like, okay, this is like amazing. And the next one would come out, I'm like, okay, this one's even better. Um, that's a really tough one. Yeah, I don't know if I can pick one. Okay, I think the one, okay, the one that made the biggest impact on me was the one where, with, like, the Henry um, and Sam storyline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that episode, like, I cried so much. <laughs> um, so maybe, the, yeah, I'd say that one was prob- probably made, like, the biggest impact. And then episode three also made an impact. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, the Hen- Henry and Sam was just awful. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't join Brooke's Twitter space after that. I'm like, I'm going to bed. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no! So I broken. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> like I knew what was coming, and still. Oh, I didn't know what was coming. Like I, I mean, you kind of know that they're not gonna make it, but then I just I didn't even think it was gonna go down that way at all. Even even like after they made it to the hotel, I like <laughs> I let myself have a moment where I was like, oh maybe maybe, maybe they'll be okay. <laughs> maybe yeah. they'll just part ways, <laughs> you know. And that's why they're not gonna be in the rest of the show. But oh no. <laughs> I think weren't you live tweeting it? Oh and, yes. Yeah, yeah and yeah. then you, oh, you yeah. said it, there was one, a lot of profanity. You said one thing and I almost like DM'd you and I was like, oh Sue. Oh my god, <laughs> we we made it to the hotel. <laughs> like I should I should have I mean I knew, but like part of me was like I could see a different route. I could see them actually surviving and I was like, okay, there's still like I don't know how many minutes left it. I think it was like 10 minutes or five minutes or something. I'm like, there's still a lot of time for something to happen. But so much stuff has just happened. <laughs> surely nothing more. <laughs> surely, surely, even if they do, you know, get infected or die or whatever, I'm like, it's not going to like, yeah, infected, die all the time. But no, just the way that it went down was so heartbreaking. Uh so we were we were talking about the finale. Uh, we were mm-hmm. just talking about uh, the uh, lack of choice given to Ellie by both the Fireflies yeah. when they just, you know, put her under anesthesia and then Joel when he lies to her. Uh-huh. And I wonder if they, you know, well, the first thing I would have done as Joel when I woke up is like after asking about where Ellie is, like, all right, who was the dude that hit me? I get one free hit. Um, <laughs> but... The other thing is, I wonder if they had set them down. I think 
we're all pretty confident that Ellie would have said yes, even if it means my life, like, you know. Um, yeah. But I wonder if they had sat them down, uh, whether in two different ways would have gone, would Ellie have been able to talk Joel down? And the second one would be, would Joel have been able to, you know, like having been a parent, but also being like an older guy, having been to the doctor, been like, okay, well, what about like, wh why is your first option like surgery that would have killed her like wh what what are the other options here and whether that would have convinced ellie to not do it and then at that point they have to fight their way out you know like those two different scenarios like is there a possibility where joel would have been able to go along with this and where ellie would not have gone along with this mm -hmm. i think the an interesting thing to bring up is is that Marlene, she struggles with the choice. I think you mm -hmm. get this more in the game than you do in the show um, from her recordings that you find in the game, um, mm -hmm. that she, she greatly struggles with this choice. And I think based on that, it's kind of clear that like she doesn't have a choice because it's not just her. It's mm -hmm. all of the other fireflies. And if she had resisted, I want like, they probably would have killed her too. <laughs> They probably would have or exiled her mm. or whatever, sent her off. And then no one would have told Joel what was going to happen. They might have even just killed him and not wanted to deal with the collateral damage that would come mm. with telling him. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's, it's such a complex. Like there's so many different variables. Like, mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. One thing yeah. I want to talk about, too, is that, like, you know, I mean, most of us, I think, probably agree that, like, yeah, Ellie not having a choice in this is, like, probably, like, the most, like, fucked up part of it. But also part of the reason that Ellie even wants to do this is because she has survivor's guilt from what happened with her friend. So mm -hmm. there's also the idea, like, okay, this is a child with survivor's guilt. You know, mm -hmm. does Ellie just love humanity so much she feels like this is, like, what she wants to do to save everyone? <laughs> Or does she feel like, um, you know, the only way her life is going to have any meaning or any purpose is if she dies, you know, or, or is if she uses, it is if she's able to, you know, help, you know, create a vaccine in some way. So that's mm -hmm. also another take I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, I've seen that too. And I think, see, that was never really a part of the discourse before the show. Mm -hmm. um, particularly like around her age. Um, and I find it really interesting because like a lot of time you'll see people say like, this is in a post-apocalyptic world. Um, therefore the way that we would handle things isn't applicable to how they handle them for like excusing the things that Joel does or the things that, you know, the, the resistance groups do to get rid of Fedra. But mm -hmm then that kind of just gets forgotten when it comes to the fact that, you know, Ellie lives in this world too. And she has had these experiences that are very valid and that have shaped who she is as a person. And is that less important than someone else's? Or is that, is that less important just because she's 14? Would mm -hmm. four years change that at all? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I think it's interesting that this is coming up with the show far more than it is with the game. And I wonder if it's because it's an actual person playing that we're seeing on screen and not animated. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I think that my, my opinion on it all is that Ellie had the right to a choice regardless mm -hmm. of her age mm -hmm. and her experiences make it to where I think she would be well within her rights to decide for herself and that mm -hmm. Joel wasn't in a position to decide that for her as much as I love him and as much as I understand why, and I probably would have done the same thing. I do understand Ellie's emotions behind it. Mm -hmm. I think too, it's just like, not like, it's just not fair that Ellie has to make, even if she was given the choice that she would have to make the choice at all. Like she, I, I don't think it's fair that she's put in this position in the first place because she didn't ask mm -hmm. to be born and then asked to be, oh, now she's immune and now she's the only immune person that they've ever found. So like, it's up to her. And I feel like she feels probably a lot of that responsibility, which is 
not mm-hmm. something that a f- real like a, in our world a 14 year old should never be you know given that much responsibility on like all of humanity so it just like mm-hmm. sucks that it's like that she's put in the position in the first place and i think i i do think it is also like i feel like her maybe internal struggle with choosing like if she were i think we've all kind of said that she would probably choose to go on with the surgery is more of like a personal choice than it really mm-hmm. is thinking about the whole scope of the entire world. Cause yeah. like she really up until this like adventure, she's had a very limited scope of her world because she's been uh, sheltered under Fedra and even Fedra has been like, you know, they teach about like, Oh, your, your existence is for the collective. Like your existence is not to be, an individual person it's to like to help mm-hmm. or whatever mm-hmm. so i think that also kind of goes into her feelings about it yeah i just had two thoughts uh don't ask me why this is just where my brain <laughs> went um so from the perspective so uh historically uh women and communities of color have been disproportionately affected by the medical field, whether that's misdiagnoses, um, not, uh, you know, myths that certain groups of people have a higher tolerance for pain or, uh, you know, are or our uh, descriptions of pain or complaints of pain are either over dramatized or, you know, downplayed. I wonder mm-hmm. if that plays into some people's um, view of the fireflies and the doctor and what they're trying to do since their first thing is like, all right, cut her brain open. Mm -hmm. See, I've, I've, it's such a complicated thing because we see that they have been doing tests Mm -hmm. throughout. Like it's not like this is their first time ever thinking about it and they have been, have been testing it. But I do think there's a separation there because I, I don't know. I'm always very careful with this because I don't think the fireflies are the bad guys. Just like, I don't think Joel's the bad guy. I think they're all just fighting for their purpose and they make really shitty decisions along the way, every single one of them. And, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know if that was actually, I have a question about that because I wasn't really sure whether they had been doing tests because they haven't met anybody who's immune so far. So how did they, find all that information and they've like, been I, oh no sorry Sue I thought you were oh no I was just gonna say like how did they figure out like all of the stuff that they needed to do without having somebody who was immune to do the tests on and then why is that like the only option forward like go straight into brain surgery and then if that goes wrong then like you've just lost the one opportunity you have versus trying to do other things like um what was it they said like there was like messengers or something that the cordyceps in her body creates that Mm -hmm. signals to other um, cordyceps that she is a cordyceps so they don't infect her. So why didn't they try to like replicate those messengers or like harvest them from her body and see if they can like implant it into somebody else or something? Like I would have thought like, you know, you don't just squander the first and only chance that you have, aka like a person who is immune by just immediately cutting them open and killing them. That was like my, my, the one thing that like just quite makes sense to me, but maybe I don't I didn't see kind of or didn't understand how much research they had already done prior to that. They go into it a lot more in the game than they, yeah, they do okay. in the show because the the section where they go to the university, like in the show, it's just like, oh, they're gone. Here's where they mm-hmm. went. In the game, you go through like the whole university and you find a bunch of um, like tape recordings from some oh, of the scientists. Mm-hmm. And so they talk about how they've been like, testing on monkeys and whatnot and um you see that they have been doing research Mm -hmm. but as far as like about ellie in particular i i know they go into it i think a little in part two more which i'm sure they'll do for the show too but you get to see the you get to see the scans and stuff in part two yeah um but a lot of it also i think is just narrative need Mm -hmm. like they they needed to 
to amplify the urgency of yeah, this. And it. so, yeah, so, but I, I do get that. That does lead, uh, one consequence of that is it does leave yeah. the discourse open to these questions, <laughs> understandably, mm -hmm. but yeah. And yeah. The, I don't know if you remember the monkeys that we see at the university. We do, yeah. Those have been in uh, injected with the cordyceps uh, infection. And they survived. Yeah. Oh. And, um, but they're kind of like, if, if they bit you, you'd probably get it. Um, and so I think that was part of like their research to see like, if, you know, injecting it like a vaccine, you know, injecting an aspect of it with other antibodies and stuff would, I don't know anything about vaccines, how they work, but you know, doing, yeah. doing that, if that might help something, um, obviously it didn't work, but yeah. Yeah. And then oh, my my second thought was, and this, I think, Daniel, where you were saying, like, or it was Brooks said that Ellie didn't ask to be born, to be immune, mm -hmm. and, and to be this. There's a move. I'm pretty sure it's a movie. Uh, it stars Alec Baldwin and Cameron Diaz, where Cameron Diaz is a mother uh, that has three kids. Oh. Uh, the oldest kid has cancer, I believe. I think it's leukemia. And then there's a son. And then the youngest daughter, I think, I can't, mm -hmm. is it? It's not Abigail Breslin, I think. Amy yeah, no, I know exactly what movie you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and they had her purely to be the organ donor or yeah. the bone marrow donor for the oldest child. And it made me think of that because that was the mm -hmm. sole purpose of them having that third child was to be in that yeah. whole, those whole issues mm -hmm. of medical consent and being mm -hmm. able to make that choice for yourself as a child at that young age what mm -hmm. medical right. procedures you want done to you yeah Can i just yeah. say i i hate that movie because it's a bad adaptation of the book <laughs> <laughs> it, well no it ends the ending is completely different and it makes sorry this is a tangent it makes the entire purpose <laughs> of of the story moot it does mm -hmm. <laughs> but no that is a good point what agency do, do they have yeah. And again, it just makes me come back to the how how does it differ in a post apocalyptic world? How does it mm -hmm. like Ellie is already put in positions that every child in this world is put in positions that they shouldn't have to be in? Mm -hmm. And does does that make her experience any less valid? Does that make her choice any less valid? Um, mm -hmm. Which is, you know, it's one of the questions that we do have to ask. And everyone's going to have a different opinion on it, I think. But mm -hmm. like I said, it's just interesting that it's become so much more about her age since mm -hmm. the show came out. And it never was really about that in the game, discourse about the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think for me, it's it's a little less about her age. I mean, that's still a factor, but it's more about her life experiences and what she has, like, what she's known up until that point. And she's already gone through so much trauma and she hasn't had any sort of, like, semblance of a normal life with family or anything because she was an orphan straight into Fedra, which from my understanding is not how kids who are born in that in you know during the apocalypse are like if they do have their parents alive like they wouldn't they would go to school but they're not like just orphans like you know just straight into indoctrination with Fedra. so she hasn't even gotten like you know a sense of like family or anything like that and she does have riley but that's still one person who's like defending her and she's still going through like a lot of issues there. And then it's just been like trauma after trauma, you know, since the fireflies, you know, picked her up um, and she became and figured out that she's immune. Um, my other question, I mean, I guess they wouldn't have known until they found that Ellie was immune, but my question would be if they're willing to cut her open, I'm not condoning this, just a question, um, but if they're willing to cut her open and they know how she became immune, why aren't they testing that out? <laughs> Getting, you know, infecting the mothers as they're pregnant with babies or something. I know no, that that's I, I'm not. I'm not condoning that. No, at I totally. All. I, I had that thought too. You're not the only one. I was yeah, thinking about me too. That too. I that too. <laughs> like I'm just saying, well, if they're gonna go through that, like go to those lengths, obviously it's gonna take a lot more time. But it's like, if ethics are out the window, <laughs> yeah. there are plenty of options. I I wondered that too, and I wonder, like. Yeah, because in the game, we're not given as um, clear of an idea of how Ellie got her immunity. We're not told how Anna dies. Yeah. We're not told that Marlene mm -hmm. had to kill her. Um, and and so I, I I think maybe like, you know, that was something they came up with for the show. And then we're like, 
okay, <laughs> we're not gonna, <laughs> we, we don't want to deal with the ethics of that. Um, yeah, but that is an interesting question. Cause, and like, it's totally valid. Like I said, I thought mm -hmm. of that immediately. It was like, why, yeah. why wouldn't they just do that? Even though it's awful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. well, ethics have been on, out the window since they started bombing yeah. cities to slow the spread. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well I, <laughs> I was thinking about this all the way back from like episode one. Cause I had saw a post maybe on Tumblr or something about like, what if there are more immune people in the world, but because of like Fedra, you like Ellie, we saw that when they scanned her, it mm. came up as infected and yeah. they were just like euthanizing these people. Yeah. Cause it, it really made me think about like that kid in the beginning after yeah. right after the prologue. It's yeah. like, for all we know, maybe that kid was immune too, you know? And, yeah. but we would never know. And like Ellie just got unlucky, but also lucky, you know, mm -hmm. that she was in, I guess the right, had the right people looking after her. Yeah. yeah. That's a really yeah. good point. I don't think mm -hmm. I'd ever thought about it that way. Yeah. yeah. I want, so I have seen that, not that exact question, but a similar question brought up. And it was uh, after Last of Us Part Two came out um, because I don't, I don't know if this isn't an exact spoiler about what, ellie ellie's sexuality mm -hmm. and there was some homunculus that was in the comments was like oh well why would she choose to be gay when she could be pregnant and have babies that are immune i'm like what oh my god <laughs> excuse me jesus Someone's, it's a homunculus. <laughs> that's why i called, oh, it. Why I called him a homunculus <laughs> I, I just, yeah it, it's just like you uh I, I don't know how to respond to this, so I'm not going to. Uh, uh, bodily autonomy is a thing. Yeah. Uh, just saying. That's um, disgusting. But, not just turn into a baby factory. Yeah, I look forward to those comments coming back in season two. Mm. Um, oh, God. I'm not ready for season two this course. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. We're, we're gonna be in the trenches. There is there's one thing from the finale that we didn't talk about that I really wanted to talk about because oh, yeah. it's it's Ashley. something that I it made me think about when we were talking about how Joel gives Ellie the choice in episode six, mm -hmm. but it is kind of like an artificial choice because he knows what mm -hmm. she's gonna respond. And that is like I don't know why, but I felt weird about that. Like I'm like, I should like it because he's giving her a choice, but I just, that's one of my favorite parts in the game is after they have this like huge blowout fight, it's, it just feels so familial. And like, when you have, mm -hmm. you know, family or loved ones that they don't express love in words or with affection, it's like, sometimes mm -hmm. you just, it's like an unspoken thing. So I love like in the game, um, he, they like get back and they, they don't go to Jack, they don't go back to Jackson because um, Ellie ends up running away but it's kind of the same premise that she hears that Joel's trying to like get rid of her or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then Joel's basically like, okay, like I'm going to take this horse. And you said Eastern Colorado. Right. And then he's like, all right, Ellie, get on. And there's this little moment where he just goes, are you good? And she said, yeah, I'm good. And I don't mm -hmm. know why, but I love that moment so much, mm -hmm. but we got something similar in the finale when the closest we'll ever get to them telling each other that they love each other mm -hmm. is that conversation that they have where Joel is like, it was where Ellie said, Oh, I guess time heals all wounds. And he's like, it wasn't time. Wasn't time. And, that, yeah. and, then she, and then she looks at him and then she goes, well, I'm glad that that didn't work out for you. And it yeah. just, that was everything that I wanted in their relationship is like, like, what they want to say is not what they actually say. Yeah. Yeah. It feels so like authentic and just like real. I loved it. Yeah. I was waiting for him to say family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just the way he was looking at her like throughout the episode just like brought me to tears. <laughs> yeah. So I understand why he did what he did, but also. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'll always say that I, I don't, I don't like polarizing views on Joel's actions because I don't think that he was com being completely selfless, but I don't think he was being completely selfish either because mm -hmm. he does want Ellie to be able to experience joy and mm -hmm. he does want her to be able to experience peace. And the question that that brings up and the tragedy of it is that that's not necessarily what Ellie wants at that moment. And mm -hmm. 
And it that's one of the questions that's not easy to answer is, is it his right to decide that she should have that or that she should mm-hmm. have that above anything else? And, um, but I think that that can be both selfish and selfless. And it's one of those things that you don't realize it until you realize it. And mm-hmm. I just love that they've, I think the show did a good job of weaving the selfish mm-hmm. and selfless aspects of that into, yeah. into they it. They went mm-hmm. into that a little bit in the podcast episode, especially when in like um, relation to the giraffe scene. Yeah. Um, the real giraffes. The real the giraffes. Real giraffes. Real giraffes. <laughs> Not CGI giraffes. I'm offended yeah. on their behalf. The CGI they weren't. Yeah. Or it was, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they talked about like it's this like to Joel, I guess it's yeah, because like we've seen whatever innocence that Ellie had is you know, after especially after episode eight, is like that loss of innocence is just it's broken, it's gone. Um, mm-hmm. not that she had the same type of innocence like say Sarah does or Sarah yeah. would have. Um but I guess he see what seeing her with the draft makes him like think about preserving that, like what mm-hmm. little innocence that she has and that she can um, still have, like be a kid sometimes and have that joy. But then they also talked about how because of Ellie losing that innocence, like you're taking such this pure moment with the giraffe and what does Ellie say? She says, so fucking cool. Like she breaks that innocence with like an expletive. Yeah. Which I thought was kind of interesting. It was like, I th- and I think that that's kind of the start of maybe where uh, Joel and Ellie's like understanding of who Ellie is differ. Just, Cause he's yeah. coming from now the eyes of a parent. Like he's, mm-hmm. as soon as he called her baby girl, he accepted her as his daughter, you know? And yeah. But without even really talking to Ellie about it explicitly. Mm-hmm. And like we said, Ellie's never had a parental figure like that before. Mm-hmm. So she doesn't, she might not, she just, just doesn't have that experience. Mm-hmm. And it it might not be what she wants either. Like, mm-hmm. like right. I said, uh, back in episode six, when they're, you know, traveling to the university and that's like Neil Druckmann said, that's the happiest they will ever be in their relationship Mm -hmm. because they're at the same level of understanding of Mm -hmm. what they want their relationship to be, which is just trust and um, protecting each other and nothing more Mm -hmm. and nothing less than that. And the minute that things start changing and Joel decides how he wants to view her without Ellie being at the same level is Mm -hmm. both a beautiful and heartbreaking thing. I think there's also the reason that it kind of like shifts and it, and it's disconnected is like Joel can see the pain that she's in. Like before the draft scene, she was basically like, you know, PTSD, she's disassociating and he can see that. And you can see like their relationship flip where he's the one talking constantly, trying to mm-hmm. make her laugh, trying to make her feel better, just rambling about himself. And she's just very quiet and like half the time she's not listening. So he's seeing back of her they're not really acknowledging it and they're not talking about it and it's almost like she doesn't want to acknowledge it like she doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that she does I guess like she's not in a state to be making like big decisions at that point because of what she's been through that she hasn't necessarily like dealt with because it's still fresh I'm also like not sure how long it's been but it seems to be something that's still lingering with her so I wonder if like part of the reason that he decides and he makes the the choice for her and decides to protect her is because he knows that yes she's able to make the choice for herself but is it going to be something that she's going to be able to um like separate like the the recent events from as opposed Mm -hmm. to being able to like you know make that choice with um have been been making the same choice if those recent you know events hadn't happened um so he's kind of like trying to protect her in a way like He's trying to protect her in the way that he knows how, but as opposed yeah. to like you know acknowledging uh, or talking about you know the emotions and, and and experiences that she's been through, he's just sort of taking over as opposed to yeah. trying to get her to like the level of understanding of where 
he is because he's gone through traumatic experiences and he knows how that affects him you know given what he told her just after the the draft scene and so in his mind he's probably like well she's still dealing with you know the aftermath of whatever happened and he may not even know exactly what happened but he has an idea of it just being really traumatic mm-hmm. he's like well I wasn't making good choices she's probably not going to make good choices even though he knows what the choice is going to be so he doesn't even want to put her in a position to make the choice mm. yeah it reminds me wait has everyone seen Wakanda forever yeah mm-hmm. no but that's okay <laughs> I'm super late to the game. I know. Just go for it. It's okay. fine. It just reminds me of what M'Baku says to Shuri. The mm. world has taken too much from you to still consider you a child. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think. And there was someone on TikTok. I wish I could remember what their username is, but she said something that was exactly how I feel about all of this, which is um, it's easy for us and for Joel to get wrapped up in the fact that Ellie is a child and and that she shouldn't Mm -hmm. have to be dealing with these things. She shouldn't have to be going through this. She shouldn't have to face these choices. The reality is that she is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not about what should be. It's about what is. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that is like, that's how I uh, have always approached this Mm -hmm. aspect of it. And, And I think that that is what Joel is, is resistant to and what any parent I think would be resistant Mm -hmm. to because I've, you know, I'm, I'm not a parent, but I, I have kids that I care about, my nieces and nephews, and I see mm-hmm. my sisters and how they are with them. And it is natural to, like, you're always looking to their future. Your your world is about their future. And mm-hmm. it's natural for a parent, I think, to think, to be thinking about that mm-hmm. when the kid isn't. Speaking of yeah. uh, parents and looking into their child's future, uh, let's talk about Ashley Johnson playing mm-hmm. Anna. I was gonna, Stop. yeah, I was gonna mention that. I was like, yeah, we didn't talk about that at all. Oh, that was yeah, the no. best. Ellie gave birth to Ellie. Yeah, yeah. So for those that don't know, <laughs> Ashley Johnson played Ellie, uh, voice and uh, what's the technical Mo- terms? Mocap. Bo- mocap. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for <laughs> Ellie in The Last of Us One and Two. So yeah, like Chris said, Ellie gave birth to Ellie. The minute she was using the Ellie voice too, like yeah. when, as soon as I heard yeah. it, I was like, "Oh, yeah." Well, that's also that's also like it's funny because that's like her natural voice, like her right. Her Ellie well, voice that's is her what to me. Voice. I was really excited to see both like Troy and Ashley in the show, mm-hmm. and like there, I love I love the show, but like game Joel and Ellie just like are so it, like they just mean so much to me. And yeah. so seeing Troy Baker, I was like, I can't handle this. Especially <laughs> like he has so many of Joel's mannerisms because like he is Joel. But like you there's still a degree of separation because when you look at like Troy Baker and he starts talking like normal, like he doesn't sound like Joel. Like that's a voice mm-hmm. that he has for Joel. But Ellie, Ashley Johnson t- starts speaking <laughs> and that's just Ellie. <laughs> So Mm -hmm. that was very, and like they gave her Ellie's hair, like Mm -hmm. color and like haircut that she has in the Mm -hmm. game jacket and the jacket. And it's just, uh, it was so much. And the house, the house Mm -hmm. looks a lot like the house in part two. I think that was intentional. If it wasn't, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. What's also wild to me uh, is that Ashley, Johnson has been in so many things that were a mm-hmm. part of my childhood and teenage years, yeah. like that. I was like, "Oh, that's who you are." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I oh god, I love that scene so much. I get I get so emotional talking about it because it's not just you know a video game actor playing their the parent of their video game character. It's Ashley Johnson playing Ellie's mother. And that, to me, I feel like if you play the game, you understand the difference there because Mm -hmm. Ashley cares so much about Ellie and she's spoken so much about how much of herself she put into that character and Mm -hmm. how important having a female character like Ellie was to her. And that she wishes she could have had that when she was a teenager. And it was, it's important for her to see it through. And, um, so also just so much of her Neil put into Ellie, like mm-hmm. Ellie's love for space is because Ashley loves space and all of these things that make Ellie Ellie are what make Ashley Ashley. And so to see 
her give birth to the character that she helped create was just like, it still gives me chills. And it's a scene that I'll never like, I'll always, I'll probably rewatch that hundreds of times. <laughs> now. Yeah. it like holds a special weight to it, especially like everything surrounding like the release of the game when it came out, it's like, they they fought so hard to get Ellie even just on the mm -hmm. the box art mm -hmm. of the game mm -hmm. because execs didn't think that uh, a girl or a woman or whatever on the box art of a game wouldn't sell copies. Mm -hmm. um, and it got I feel like it got a lot of women into video games mm. more than maybe any other video game. And I love it, too, because then we see like when part two comes out, Ellie's the cover. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's like one of the true. most sold video games of all time, which mm -hmm. is so cool. And like Ashley Johnson is like obviously a huge mm -hmm. part of that. Yeah. My only uh, beef is that the uh, random firefly didn't even try to cover that baby's ears. I know. <laughs> yeah. I said right? you have when they one had to job. execute Ellie's mom, I'm like, come on. You have one <laughs> job. You have one job. Put your hand <laughs> over her ear. <laughs> also, I think in that scene where, you know, Anna's begging Marlene to kill her and Marlene's like I can't do it I won't do it like yeah. it shows their closeness and then how cold she does it not yeah. cold isn't the right word how direct she does it there's yeah. like not like you know that you you stereotypical like in in movies you know you're just like yeah. I, I can't what's that like, meme just, of Wesley you, Snipes where he's crying yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. From, uh, yeah. From, uh, new, new Jack City New Jack yeah. City yeah, I think. yeah he, she just walks in shoots and then you know th yeah. that that's it um, she has that's the only way she can do it exactly mm -hmm. if like she has to separate it, she would not, not mm -hmm. she wouldn't be able to do it I loved the because like I said in the game we don't know that that's what happens and I kind of, I really like the parallel that gives to Ellie having to do that to Riley. Mm -hmm. And like, that's, that's kind of a connection between her and Marlene. Marlene's the only one who really understands what Ellie had to go through in that because she had to do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And just how awful that must be. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think maybe if I had to criticize anything. And I think this is also, I would criticize the game about this as well, is that we don't get a lot of Marlene. Yeah. I wish that they would maybe flesh her out. Well, and especially in the show, they changed. So in the game, Ellie already knew Marlene and knew who she was. Yeah. And they changed that in the show to make it that like, they had never met before, even though um, Marlene has such this extensive history with her mom. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, I don't want to say that like, I didn't care when Joel like kills her at the end, <laughs> but I feel like it would have meant more or been like more emotionally like hard to, to swallow yeah. if we had gotten more of like got maybe gotten more attached to her character, or understood mm -hmm. her character more than they give us in the, in the show and the game. Yeah. And I, I get why they changed like, you know, from a storytelling perspective, I get yeah. why they changed that. But I think it was also such a miss because Ellie had a connection with Marlene. Like right. they talked yeah. a lot before this and mm -hmm. Ellie, you know, she was always saying that Ellie couldn't join the Fireflies because I have to imagine that it's because she couldn't protect her then. Like she would have to send her out on death missions. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I did another podcast earlier and I thought for the first time, is that why Marlene stayed in Boston all this time? Mm -hmm. Like, because we know that the fireflies move around a lot and they're sent to different bases, but she's stayed in Boston this whole time. Is it because of Ellie so mm -hmm. that she could keep an eye on her? And I was just like, I wish that had been, you know, kind of made a bit more direct. And I'm hoping yeah. that maybe they'll do some like, you know, some maybe some flashbacks in season two or something that we can still have Marlene in, especially because Merle Dandridge is just such a great actor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's actually really interesting. I think if they had like that relationship or that history in the show, it would have made the finale hit a little bit better mm. because then like you see Marlene struggle with it, but then our understanding of it is like, oh, because she knew her mother, not because she knew Ellie directly. Like that yeah. would have 
made that hit a lot harder and like made us as an audience like understand just how big of a a decision this was and like just how important it was for I mean obviously we understand like you know curing the world but it would have just hit that much harder and then later when Ellie in the car when she's waking up and she asks about Marlene for a second there I was like wondering I'm like why does she care <laughs> like she's barely yeah. seen her right mm -hmm. like yeah she saw her just briefly before she handed her off to Joel and like yes there was a conversation there but it would have been like a few hours of them knowing each other and so part of me's like yeah why does she care like yeah why whether she's okay or not but. yeah I guess in the show, it, it could be like one way you could reason it is that Marlene was the only person who knew her mother and uh, yeah. there was, you know, something like that. But I do think, yeah, I do. I do wish they'd kept it in the show that she knew that mm -hmm. she knew her and everything that went into that, um, which is why mm -hmm. I hope people play the game or watch the playthroughs or, or something <laughs> so that they get yeah. that they get those moments um, yeah. that are really powerful for Marlene. Mm -hmm. I also hope that, you know, when, you know, it's a few months out or they release it to you, the Blu-ray box set or whatever, they just include that alternate ending from the video game in, in there. I need to see that with the <laughs> live action uh, crew. Uh, Sue, yeah, I know you have no idea musical. what we're talking about. Uh, I will <laughs> show you. I have it pulled up. I would put it on here, but I don't want to deal with like yeah. having anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll yeah. show you after. Did um, you know? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Did you know that that was completely Merle? She mm -hmm. she didn't tell Troy that she was gonna yeah. do it. It was supposed to be a prank on him, and he just went along and with, he it. Went with it so perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ash yeah. Ashley in the background giggling, and like that's all of us like dying mm -hmm. watching this. <laughs> the best part though is like at the end you see them all T pose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what they did for the kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Um, but yeah, so uh, as we wrap up this this uh, wonderful discussion about this heart wrenching show, um, <laughs> let's let us know your uh, final thoughts and uh, where people can find you and any uh, projects you're working on. We're gonna start with Sue. All right, um, final thoughts. This this was incredible. I mean, obviously, I don't have the same like history as you guys do with the game, but this like shot up to like my number one show. <laughs> pretty quickly um and that's saying something because like i i like a lot of shows but rarely do i like love and obsess over a show like this show has been so good and i know i'm like super behind on posting and it's not because i don't like the show it's because every time i go to edit i just cry um but I will, I will, I will get those in. So where you can find me, um, Sue Theories at uh, on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and then, like I said before, I do live reactions. I post earrings that I make to match the shows that I'm watching. And then every so often, I'll have theories, or I'll talk about like various things, um, generally around like, um, like, uh, like North African diaspora or Muslim representation in media. So yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you, and. Uh, well, Chris usually says this, so I'll leave him for saying it. Uh, your, your usual thing, you're always welcome back on the podcast. Oh, Thank yeah. You. Yeah. You're always welcome back for sure. Uh, next, we'll go with Danielle. Yeah, I am on TikTok at written in the Star Wars and Instagram written in the SW and Twitter Danny S394 because I can't have anything be simple. Um, and I don't know that I have any projects right now. I'm kind of taking a breather after The Last of Us because I was doing articles for Temple of Geek, but uh, I'm just going to be perpetually waiting for the next season and talking about clones in the meantime for Star Wars. <laughs> the clone expert, y'all. <laughs> and last but not least, Brooke. You can find me. I'm on uh, Twitter and TikTok and Instagram at underscore bedazzler underscore. Um, Twitch is b underscore underscore dazzler because you can't start something with an underscore on Twitch for some reason. Um, <laughs> so we're going with that. Um, I make some stuff sometimes. You can go to Far Far Away Factory on Etsy. Um, you could go to farfarawayfactory.com, but I have not renewed my subscription. 
um, to the website. <laughs> so you can't buy anything on there currently. Um, as far as projects go, uh, I'm doing a lot of cosplay stuff right now because I'm going to Star Wars Celebration. Um, I haven't really posted a lot of content about that, though. Normally, I like to, like, document stuff that I'm making, but now I'm just in a panic to finish everything. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so now, instead of crying over Pedro Pascal and his human child, I will be crying over him and his green little alien baby on TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> this is the way. I yeah. thought it was funny that, like, you had, like, a couple weeks where Last of Us and Mandalorian air at the same time. Like, did they plan <laughs> yeah. this? Probably. I really was upset. I was like, my brain is fully on The Last of Us. I really want to be excited for The Mandalorian because it's my favorite Star Wars show. But they, they just had to do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Before we sign off, so I just want to say uh, the Oscars were last week. Um, congrats to all the winners. Uh, Angela Bassett, we love you, Auntie. We love you, Auntie. <laughs> um, all right. Well, Chris, you got anything else? Uh, nope. Uh, I am also in a panic about Star Wars Celebration with cosplay, <laughs> so that's that's yeah. fun. I'm uh, sure. I'm sure we'll probably you'll probably we'll probably just sort of recap when you get back. Yeah. I've also been requested to be on Sisters with Sabres for that recap because they want the tea. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> all right. Well, um, yeah. All right. Well, until next time, thank you all for listening. And I, I, I always, you guys are great guests and welcome back anytime. Um, and uh, live long and prosper. There are more of us. <laughs>